Hey guys, Maven here, and in case you didn't know, from 2001 through 2005, I had the chance to work with amazing talent during my time in the WWE. Were they nice? Were they mean? What were they like backstage? Backed by popular demand, rating WWE wrestlers I worked with. Just in case you were wondering, no notes. Ah, love this guy. I don't think fame is something that he necessarily enjoys or was going after. And there's no one nicer that you'll ever run into in any wrestling locker room. I'm talking about Jeff Hardy. Jeff was one of those guys that I don't think he ever said no to anything that was ever presented to him. And I mean that in a good way. I remember I worked him uh, probably a few months after I was released in a independent show um, in Virginia. And after the match, I, I, I had green paint all over me. <laughs> and I went backstage and he was as concerned as I was whether or not I enjoyed the match. And I was just like, yeah, Jeff, it was fine. And he was like, was everything, okay? you sure everything was okay? And I was just like, Jeff, it, everything was perfect, brother. I was just happy to be out there with you with someone so over. You know, that tells you everything you need to know about Jeff. Now, backstage, Jeff kept to himself. He was an introvert and, you know, he was as polite as it gets, but Jeff didn't go out of his way to really talk to, to many people, but that's just because that's the, the individual that he was. Jeff would get heat for showing up late, and I know uh, I've read the stories out there of you know just how he's showed up to matches before. I can promise you, that's not because he is a, a, a bad guy or not thinking of others, you know, well-being at all. That's just, yeah, we're all, none of us are perfect. Jeff's one of those guys that truly, they say don't meet your heroes because they won't live up. And there's people that are definitely like that. This is one guy you can definitely meet. Let's see who the next one is. Ah, well, I mean, obviously we're doing Matt. Whenever I think of Matt, I think of Matt Hardy Brand. Where Jeff was the quiet one backstage, Matt was the one that was the social, social butterfly. He was constantly, constantly making sure that the Hardy Boys were put in the best position for them. I actually broke my arm in a house show wrestling Matt in Des Moines, Iowa. It was at the end of the end of a match and I went off and the spot was I was going to go off with a high cross body. He was going to roll under and I miss and land. And when I landed, I actually landed in just a freak accident. My elbow shattered instantly. Matt, he made sure he checked on me, you know, as much as he could. Checked on me that whole night, checked on me the following day. And, you know, that's just, again, that just shows the kind of guy he is. Great guy backstage, um, to this day, still happy. Whenever I see him, you know, I could, you know, I, I consider him a friend. Got his number in my phone, could call him right now. And I guarantee you, if I asked him for something reasonable, reasonable, the answer would be yes. Here we go. Uh, my goodness gracious, where do I begin with this guy? There's a difference in weight room strength and grown man strength. Um, this guy had grown man strength. Obviously, we're talking about Mark Henry, sexual chocolate. I had a, uh, a match with, with Mark, and let me explain the difference real quick. As big and as strong as I got, man, I, I, I had beach muscles. But then there were a few guys in the locker room who I mean, just strong as an ox. Then I wrestled Mark Henry, and we had a spot. And the spot was he shoots me into a corner and comes over and hip tosses me out of the corner. Now, Mark, <laughs> his whole gimmick, the strongest man in the world, I've never been thrown like I was that night. He hip tossed me, threw me across the ring, safely, mind you. I knew this was gonna happen. And when I landed, I bounced and my leg hit the rope on the opposite corner. I mean, this man threw a, me, another grown man, and he handled me like like I was a sack of potatoes. I love Mark. I actually talked to Mark not too long ago. He is the uh, the same guy now as he was then. He always was one of the most respected guys back in that locker room. And it wasn't a fear aspect. It wasn't because people were were fearful fearful of Mark. Mark was just happy-go-lucky. Mark was one of the guys that always had a smile on his face. He was well-liked in the locker room strictly because of his 
attitude. I remember the night, the night that I broke my leg, the greatest night of Tori Wilson's life after she, you know, was able to kiss me. That loop I was riding with Mark and with Devon, and Mark and Devon took me to the hospital and after they set my leg and took care of me, Mark took me the next morning to the airport, made sure I was on my flight before he put himself on his flight. And thinking of, you know, it, I'm trying to think if Mark had any enemies backstage and to be perfectly honest, I think people I think people knew better. Mark was Mark was one of those legit guys. I I I wasn't about to to piss him off and I think most most other guys in that locker room knew knew and felt the same way. But then again, Mark, he was so he's one of those guys he's hard not to like. Ah, yeah, the the voice of uh, professional wrestling. Of course, Michael Cole. <laughs> Man, back in my day in the early 2000s, you know, Michael Cole was one of the guys that that backstage, I mean, it, we, everybody, we, I don't wanna say we laughed at him, we laughed with him at his expense. I don't wanna say he was a guy that, that was easily picked on, but you know, he, he could laugh at a joke about himself. Michael was always very, you know, very well liked backstage. I remember he would always only chime in about our matches you know, just to help him do a better job. You know, maybe we might have a spot in a specific area or, you know, we might be wanting to get a story over and Michael would want to know, you know, during this part of the match, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And he wanted to be able to you know, relate that, relay that to the fan base as best as he could. If I had any interaction with Michael during a TV day, it was just to let him know, to be aware of specific spots that we had later on in the night. I wish him well. I, I, I think Michael's gonna be one of those guys who's probably in this business until he deems it necessary to move on to something else. I know exactly why, why we uh, picked this. Cause I just mentioned her. I brought her up as having the night of her life, <laughs> of course, Tori Wilson. Back in the late 90s, during her WCW time, moving into when I moved you know, into the WWE, I didn't think there was anyone on this planet that was hotter than Tori Wilson. Backstage, you're not gonna find anyone sweeter than Tori. As attractive as Tori was and still is, she would lead and greet you every time with a smile. She would always ask how you're doing. And during this time, she was married to Billy Kidman. Tori always had a, just a, a great, you know, relationship with everyone backstage. Tori was one of the few women that could get along with all the females backstage. and. And I guarantee you there was heat. Tori didn't do too much physical interactions in the ring. Now, she wasn't out there wrestling full matches a lot. She wasn't out there, you know, I remember Stacy Keebler getting put through tables. Tori Wilson bypassed all that. Tori had a made a good career of herself just being Tori Wilson. And I think that might have got her a little heat with the with a lot of the other girls backstage. What were my interactions like with, with Tori? Take yourself back to, to uh, middle school and your first crush and whenever you'd be in the hallway and you would see your crush coming down and I, you know, one of two things are gonna happen. You're either going to you know, kick in cool, you know, your, your cool guy and walk up and talk to your crush or you're gonna duck into your lockers. I don't remember exactly which one it was for me when I saw Tori. I tried to I tried to act like the cool guy, but more than more than anything, I was probably ducking off into the locker. Tori was hard to uh, hard to look at and not stare at. But once you got to know her, you you would see that there is so much more, so much more substance there than just a pretty face. There was a kind disposition. There was a just a genuine you know amazing attitude and I don't know if our paths again will ever cross but if so I would look forward to seeing that that smile on her face once again all right let's see who's next oh man all right I see this guy a handful of times a year and every time I see him it's always just you know a quick you know good catching up with him um, another one that changed the wrestling business Kevin Nash. Kevin was one of those, one of those wrestlers that was attached to a uh, a very healthy contract in WCW. So when Kevin came over, 
he might have had a little bit of heat with with the guys backstage but that heat was only jealousy. I never, you know, had the chance to interact with him within the ring, so I don't know how it was putting a match together, but there was absolutely no one cooler backstage. Obviously, when he did get to the WWE, I had been there a little bit, but I in no way, shape, or form was at the level of a Kevin Nash. But it didn't matter. He never big-timed me. He never never treated me like I was you know, less than the level that he was on. I'm happy that I have a small, extremely small relationship with Kevin. If he ever needed anything of me, the answer would be yes. We just did Kevin, so of course we got to do now the bad guy. Quick story about, uh, <laughs> a little bit of an embarrassing story about about Scott. It was after after a show and we were all we all went out and we all found ourselves at a specific bar and I find found myself at the bar talking with uh, with Scott and you know just the same way Kevin was cool Scott was the epitome of cool and we had been you know chatting for probably 15 20 minutes not about wrestling just life in general and uh, and you know Scott you know, just what you saw was what you got, and he answered questions slowly and very deliberately. And I don't know what came over, oh gosh, I'm embarrassed even thinking about it to this day. I don't know what came over me, but at some point, I told him how big of a fan I was and how much I loved Razor Ramon and the gimmick. And I remember to this day, like, oh, it's so embarrassing because he stopped me. He literally said, okay, enough. Like, I get it. And it's still embarrassing to this day to think about that. And for a couple of days after that, I was probably a little bit embarrassed to go up to Scott. It was in inspiring just to be in his presence. And um, yeah, the world's a world's a little less cool with uh, without Scott in it. Oh my goodness. Yeah, just all I gotta do is say three, three numbers and you'll know who I'm saying. And those numbers are six, one, nine, Rey Mysterio. Whenever someone asks me or they tell me, yeah, I've always wanted to get into wrestling, but I just don't think I'm big enough. I've said the same thing for years. I'll say, hey, you're not Rey Mysterio or you're not the big show, meaning you're not the smallest guy in the business and you're not the biggest. Although I'm sure some of you are gonna say, well, great Kali was bigger. Sure, whatever. Big show's more well known. Ray would always, always greet every room he went into with a smile that went ear from ear. And he has one of those smiles that's just infectious. Ray was loved by everybody. Ray, you know, probably still is loved by everybody. I can't speak for people in that locker room, but I guarantee you the people that he's coming in contact with probably view him in like in all, obviously, you're seeing Ray Mysterio with the mask on, and probably a 90% chance you've never seen him without his mask. Well, I, whenever I think of Ray, I don't think of him with the mask on. You know, the only time he would have the mask on would be when he was going out and working backstage. He never had the mask on, and he would put the mask on right before he went up to his little area, you know, below the ring when they would shoot him up. But yeah, another great guy. Love Ray, happy, happy he's still able to perform, and not only perform, but perform at the highest of levels. Hope he's able to do it another 20 years. Oh my goodness. Huh. All wrestling is, is good versus evil. That's all it is. Rooting against the big, the ogre, the, the bad guy, the heel. There's never been anyone better at portraying that than Jim Cornette. When I got to HWA, Heartland Wrestling, one of WWE's developmentals at the time, the other developmental territory was OVW, Ohio Valley Wrestling. And the guy running Ohio Valley was this man, Jim Cornette. We would go and do our TV taping in Ohio Valley and OVW every Sunday. And I remember we went down for our first taping and it was the first taping that I was going to be on. And Jim pulled me aside and he told me and he laid out and it was the first time that I had someone lay out what they their hopes 
were for my character. He was like, you're the tough enough kid. Obviously, we're gonna have you coming out to the music. Are you tough enough? And it was before I had my music that, that you know and think of to this day and I hate. If you know this business and you know this man, you know he is infamous for his rants. He has some of the best one-liners of all time. My interactions with him were always positive. He was always there just to help us put our TV product forward. And although I would see some of his rants, they were never directed at me, so that's a good thing. But if anything, he wanted things done his way because they were the best way to do them. The last rating wrestlers uh, video, I talked about a woman who has changed the business. And I think I actually mentioned this one. There's a couple of women that have changed the business, obviously Trish Stratus um, being one of them. But I don't think you're talking about a women's, uh, women's wrestling division without, without Lita. All I can say is for you know, my interactions with Lita, never anything but sweet, kind, always willing to help. I never saw her being, you know, rude or taking liberties with any of the any of the girls and she was always one of the ones who was, you know, willing to offer up just better ways to be a woman's wrestler if you were willing to listen. It was a weird time towards the tail end of my career for women wrestling, women's wrestling. Now, what do I mean by that? Without being PC about it, they were trying to bring more hot, hot girls into the business. And when you do it, when you look for talent that way, you circumvent the, the importance of being a good technical wrestler. Some of the you know, wrestlers that cut their teeth, you know, the, the Leaders, the Molly Hollies, the Trish Stratuses, you know, you know, it definitely, it affected them and, you know, it made them, I feel it pissed me off too. I completely understand. I'm happy that she has, uh, has had the career she's had. I hope she is happy somewhere. I, I wish her nothing but the best. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, may work on your game. <laughs> Love this guy. Just did his show. Wish I could. Uh, wish I could talk to him on a daily basis. Obviously, Booker, five times. Man shares the same last name as me, although we are not related. Booker was incarcerated. Booker spent time actually in in prison. If there is a better redemption story out there, I'm all ears. I'd love to hear it. Um, to go from incarceration to you know, be a hall of fame. Wow. I mean, but that just says, you know, what the man, you know, what the man's character is like. If you've ever seen the, you know, the infamous incident where Booker and Steve were in the supermarket, that's my favorite wrestling segment ever. All, all wrestling segments. That's my favorite. I, I was actually able to, you know, to, to work with Booker, you know, right after that um, and it was my fourth match in the business and you know I'm extremely grateful that I was able to be in the ring with a true Hall of Famer, a true legend. Book was one of the guys that I looked up to before I got into the business and he's one of the guys that once I got there never big time me, never made me feel like I didn't belong but it was because I earned his respect in the ring and I earned his respect backstage with how I handled things. Book is old school. Book views wrestling with an old school mentality. Book's gonna hit you hard in safe places. Book wants the same thing in return. He wants you to hit him hard in safe places. He asked me when I did his show not too long ago, you know, yeah, Mave, did I when when we worked, man, did I did I catch you? Did I, did I get you with anything? And I told him, you didn't hit me in any way I wasn't expecting. And you didn't hit me in any way that Bob Holly didn't prepare me for. Book, I thank you and I look forward to our paths crossing again, hopefully sooner rather than later. Here we go, let's see who is next. Aha, Maven. <laughs> when I think of wrestling in my head, two people come to mind. One is Tony Schiavone. That's the, the voice I grew up listening to when I listened to a, old NWA. The second voice that in my head I hear is good old JR, Jim Ross. <laughs> Recently, JR was doing his podcast and my name came up during his show. Um, and I'll be 100% honest, 
Very few things has shocked me more than what JR had to say about me during my time in the WWE. He had nothing but positive, glowing things to say about you know, not only my time, but what I'm doing today. I'm not even sure if you know, during my time in the WWE, if JR was an advocate for me backstage in production meetings, that I don't know, and I'll never know. His voice carried weight with Vince McMahon. So you were always you know, managing your P's and Q's whenever you came across JR. You certainly, well, I certainly wasn't speaking my clear, unvarnished mind when I was around JR. Like if I was upset with something, this is the man I was not gonna let know. So we're coming back from an overseas trip and not the overseas trip where Devon saved me, but a different overseas trip. And I took advantage of the duty free. And when I was going through TSA, they were checking my, um, my belongings and there was a big bottle of Jack Daniels and it just so happened you know the fates the gods made it that JR was checking in right behind me so as I'm unlimit, uh, unloading the contents of my bag so they could take the duty free and put it in with the duty free stuff because you're not allowed to fly with that stuff JR sees a big handle of Jack Daniels and he just commented you know you know something to the effect of well it looks like it looks like Maven's gonna have a party when he gets back <laughs> and I just remember thinking oh god there's a long list of guys I wish would have seen that instead of Jim Ross I'm happy that JR is still obviously working within the business and what he's doing with AEW and his podcast I wish JR just years of years of continued happiness and success. Take care, slobber knocker. All right, let's see who's next. Ah, uh, here we go. Huh, well, obviously when you do JR, who else do you gotta do after that? You gotta do the king. I can only speak to what, you know, I saw backstage, and what I saw backstage was a man who was respected by all. Now, whether he was liked by all, that I don't know, but I do know he was respected by all. Now, now backstage, our interaction would be, it would be, minimal i would see him obviously maybe through catering or out at the ring but yeah he was along with the other guys that were in the production meetings he was busy all day so his interactions with you know guys of my caliber was very very limited i know other guys top guys guys like rock austin taker hunter guys like that he would probably interact with more but their segments would be longer. They would have more of them. They would just naturally be on the show longer. So it's just, you know, it, you know stands to reason that King's interactions with them are gonna be a little bit longer. Guys like me, you know, the, the four to six minutes, yeah, I didn't see too much of him. But when I did, he was always cordial and always polite. Oh my goodness, I'm actually glad we're doing, we're doing this guy. I still hear this guy in my head telling me, yeah, keep your hands out your pockets, lad. The story behind that is I'm out at the ring. Well, one of the couple times I was out at the ring <laughs> and I, I, I feel somebody tap me on the shoulder as I'm standing with both my hands in my pockets. And it was William Regal. And he told me, and it's still, I still remember this years later. He told me, you're, you're a fighter, you're a fighter. Fighters do not, fighters never stand with their hands in their pockets. They have to be ready. And that's just always stayed with me to this day. Goldberg had a match early in Goldberg's WCW career with, with Regal. And I mean, both of these guys are gonna tell the story a little bit different. Goldberg says that, that, that Regal took liberties with him. And Regal says the office told them to have a competitive match with Goldberg. I tend to stand behind Regal and his interpretation of what he was told to do. Now, that said, I still think he went out and made a show. I still think he went out and proved a point, not only to Goldberg, but to the world um, about what true toughness is. But William Regal, I worked with him a handful of times. And every time we work together, the reason he has my undying respect is because 
it didn't matter if we had a four minute segment. He made it a point that I was going to learn something during my day's interaction with him. He was going to not only you know, tell me what we were going to be doing, but explain the why behind it. You know, he, in essence, made me a better wrestler. He's one of the guys I wish I would have, you know, just you know, stuck to like glue. Um, because I probably would have had a longer and more fruitful career had I have paid attention to William Regal. On the road, we were in Ohio and we were at the time near one of his houses. Randy and, and Regal, they were you know, pretty close at the time and Randy and I both liked animals and Regal told us that he you know, could get us into a reptile farm. So we actually went to this reptile farm with William Regal, had a behind scenes, behind the scenes tour. Yeah, I was a, it was a good time. I hope he's doing well. I know he is still actively involved within this business. Probably be like that until he decides he's no longer going to be in this business. And I'll tell you what, everyone who comes in contact under his tutelage, they're better for it. Oh my goodness. I've mentioned this guy a couple times as the best natural athlete I've ever seen and I stand behind this statement. My, my immediate reaction to Shelton when I first met him was that God was showing off when he made this guy. At OVW, they used to tighten the ropes and Shelton would legitimately walk all four corners of them just to show how amazing of an athlete he was. Orton and I were out one night and we were you know, trying to keep a low profile, but you know, of course I was talking to a girl and, and a girl's you know, boyfriend comes up and obviously, you know, takes, takes umbrage with me hitting on his girl, to which I didn't, I'm like, I'm trying to explain to the guy, dude, I have no clue. You know, she, she didn't tell me she had a boyfriend and Randy standing there beside me and then in comes Shelton and he legitimately stands in front of me and Randy and tells the guy, okay, you might fight them, but you're not fighting them until you get through me first. And I still remember it because Randy turns and looks down at me and said, he's going to fight our battles for us too. And I think I started laughing, which further enraged the guy. But as Shelton's standing there in front of him, he knew he wasn't getting to me at that point. And the minute the guy found out that, that this was going to be, you know, his prize for trying to get to me, he quickly backed down and wanted no part of what Shelton had had to offer. I don't think there's probably anyone on this planet that has a negative word to say about Shelton Benjamin. Hope you're well, brother. Oh my goodness, Keish. Yo, Keishi was another one of those guys that when I got there, you know, it was a little intimidating being around him. Just, you know, obviously I, I know his lineage, I know, you know, what this man's family has meant to the business. He was, you know, was and still to this day is the first one to come up and, and hug and, and just embrace me whenever I see him. And I think one of the reasons that Kishi was always, you know, cool with me was because I spent a lot of time with his younger brother, Umaga Eki at HWA Heartland Wrestling. And Eki, you know, in, in, in essence told him, you know, hey, this is, Maven's one of the ones, he's one of us. Backstage, what was Kishi like? Kishi was gregarious. What do you think of when, when I say life of a party? Well, that's Kishi. Kishi had as much respect backstage in a wrestling locker room as a Mark Henry, as a Undertaker. I saw him you know, not too long ago and you know, immediately, the second I see him, just a smile and a hug. And I hope he's well. I look forward to the next time I get to see him. Okay, the next one. Ah. Eric Bischoff. Backstage, you know, Eric kept to himself, but Eric also had, you know, bigger fish to fry than to come around and chop it up with, with me and Orton and Jindrak or whoever was hanging out backstage. He had just different responsibilities. Part of the reason I didn't have much of a relationship with, with Bischoff was, and I doubt he had a relationship with many of the talent on, on the show. There'd be times when yeah, the show would start and he would come out and I wouldn't have seen him the entire day. Now that doesn't mean he wasn't there. That means he had other responsibilities. He might've been in production meetings the whole day. I really never saw him like, backstage buddying up to somebody. I 
gotta be perfectly honest with you, I don't even know how he got from town to town, meaning I don't know if he was jumping in rental cars with, with guys or if he was you know, driving by himself solo. I have no clue. Bischoff kept to himself, but that probably turned out to serve him better in the long run. When your own company is yourself, a lot less people you can piss off that way. <laughs> oh my goodness, my girl, legend. I love this girl. I'm just gonna go ahead and show it to you, Stacy Keebler. We called her Keebs backstage. In the beginning of my run, she was dating Test, and that was a shoot. She was actually dating, dating Test. And once those two, you know, separated, she jumped in the car with Randy and I probably 50 times. And she was always good for Randy and I. Stacy was a great equalizer once she got in that car. She made sure we got from ta one town to the next. Stacy was also very giving. There was a, a time after a show we went into, I want to say it was like a Texas Roadhouse or a Longhorn Steakhouse. It was a, a steakhouse chain. We walked in and, and obvious, it was obvious. We were the last people that were going to be seated for that night. One of the waitresses is visibly angered at the fact that someone seated someone in her section. Obviously, that was going to keep her at work an additional 30 minutes beyond when she could probably go home. So they provided us with a different waitress and Stacy came up with the idea, you know, because now this girl has to stay around, but she did it. So Stacy says, let's Let's make it her night. So Stacy kicked in, I kicked in, and uh, Orton kicked in, and that girl left with a $300 tip just for waiting on our table that night. And that was because Stacy had the idea. Stacy backstage was, like I said, well liked. Um, I don't know if maybe maybe some of the girls were a little bit envious of the fact that yeah, she necessarily wasn't a, a wrestler per se. I don't know how it was in that locker room. Where Stacy got, you know, got the respect from the the boys backstage was just her timing. She was always there for everything, whether it be a spot, uh, a trip spot on the apron, or just something that was going to draw, you know, someone's attention. She was her her timing was always perfect. She was sweet to everyone, nice to nice to anyone, whether it be within the business or someone that came up maybe just wanting a picture with her and a lot of those nights she was just as tired as we were all right let's see who's oh my goodness legend legend i'm gonna give you a pay-per-view and you tell me who i'm talking about uh 98 hell in a cell of course i'm talking about mick foley hardcore legend you're not going to find one person backstage that has one negative thing to say about this man he has earned everything wrestling has given him. Now, backstage, uh, what you see in the ring, that's necessarily not the Mick Foley that was backstage. Mick was more subdued. He, you could just tell, he was always, he was a character in the ring. And I think backstage, you could see a little bit more of his intellectual side. Mick was always one that you could talk to about if you had a spot that needed refining, if you had a promo that needed a bit of adjusting. Mick was always a good one to go to just to get that fine tuning. Um, he wasn't gregarious, he wasn't loud, he wasn't boisterous, um, but you, know, you knew when he was there, you knew when he was at the show, and you knew that Mick Foley you know, had everyone's, and more importantly, the show's best interest at mind. Here we go, last one. Oh my goodness, I, I see why you saved this one to last. Um, and I know people wanted me to, to do this one, but there's a, you have to be tactful. You have, there's a way to, there's a way to attack this. I say everything with the thoughts and memories of Daniel and Nancy's, Nancy's memory first and foremost. Obviously, I'm talking about uh, Chris Benoit. But I can also say that for me, and I know some can't, but for me, I'm able to, I'm able to categorize you know, Chris Benoit, the wrestler, Chris Benoit, the the monster that that did the unspeakable acts that he did. Man, I did a backstage segment with Chris the night I was the GM on Raw, and when I say 
the man was passionate. I think that undersells undersells what you know what he brought to the business. The backstage segment we did, it was me, him, and Jericho, and the story of it is I'm debating in my head whether or not I'm gonna wrestle for the title or join evolution. And and I ask those guys, hey, what do you think, guys? And Jericho encourages me, you got to take this opportunity. Triple H is lying to you, and he walks off. And and we didn't we didn't go over this beforehand. So what Chris gave was, I, I dare I say, that was his heart and soul being put out on on camera. He asked me, he was like, "How long have you been in this business?" And I said something like three and a half, four years or something. And then he tells me it took 18 years to you know, get the title, shot at the title. And just watching that back, I see the passion that he had for not only this business, but for just his, his, his rise and what it took and all those trips to Japan and all those hard matches with Eddie and all those times that somebody told him you're too small you're too short you're not you're not main event material you're you're never going to be good enough and and i think every bit of of that negativity i think every bit of that came out every time chris benoit went out and wrestled and i think it was a little bit of just years of proving people wrong man that's the chris benoit that i remember seeing and so it's hard to it's it's hard to know that where that Chris Benoit went was something as as just devastating as what happened in you know in Georgia in 2007. I still remember him bringing oh man, I still remember him bringing Daniel to to shows, and Daniel would man he looked up to his dad so much. You could tell he was, he was just, his dad was his hero. And, and I still remember, you know, Chris, you know, wanting, wanting so much to, you know, to not only be, you know, the hero to everybody backstage, but the hero to that little boy. So, and I remember Chris being proud of him and, you know, just, hugging him i remember just being because stacy keeler is the one that called me and told me what happened and i was and i just remember because i, I my mind went back and i thought i was like but you never know and i'm not going to go into i'm not going to go into some this isn't an ad for anything and it's not I, i'm not going to preach to anybody but man you never know what someone's going through you never know and and thus the world lost two, two souls that should be living still to this day. The, and then, you know, two families were gutted. And I mean gutted. And I understand, I understand when people don't want to bring up Chris's name. And I understand when a company doesn't want to use their image or likeness for anything anymore. I get it. You obviously can't market, market someone that does something so tragic and so awful. But I also think, and I can also put a very, very sturdy argument forth that when you don't talk about what happened, you run the risk and the danger of minimalizing Daniel and Nancy. I think we should talk about what happened more. Why? Because then someone might see the warning signs before this happens to someone else. I'd hate to think that that their death was in vain. I'd hate to think that simply by pushing something under the rug and not talking about it, why? Because it's convenient or why? Because it makes us feel bad that we avoid a subject. Nah, that's not the way to do it. And some of you might be watching and disagree with the fact that I'm able to talk, that I talk about it. That's perfectly fine. But I think by not talking about it, We're showing disrespect to those who suffered the ultimate price, and I refuse to do that. 
I will forever, forever have the memory of Daniel at his father's hip. And I'll remember seeing, seeing Nancy and thinking to myself, man, that's woman, that's crazy. I'll, I'll forever carry those memories with me. And I'll forever question what it was that took someone with this much talent and made him snap.